I will be giving the message and um, as I told Rosa, I said, I, don't, I feel kind of comfortable because we're all family and we all love each other and I know nobody's going to throw tomatoes or anything at me at any given point or pull a hook out <laughs> to pull me off the podium. So I, I'm excited and I'm looking forward to this and I, I uh, actually consider it a privilege to talk about what we're going to talk about today. We're going to expand on what we heard today in the speaking of life. And we're going to be hanging around in Luke 5 uh, a bit if you've brought your um, Bibles. If you haven't, that's okay because the very capable Mr. Shields will put the scriptures up on the screen with us. So for us, we'll be talking about today and uh, examining the question if we, despite our failures or successes, are willing to go where God leads. Are we, as children of God, willing to go where he leads us? And we're going to answer that question, or look at that question, examine that question, by um, looking at the life of one of the apostles, Peter, um, who's one of my favorite apostles. I took a, a little online quiz. Actually, it was um, two, to kind of assess who... I identified with the most or what kind of character traits that I had of the apostles um, and it was online so clearly you can take it with a grain of salt but one stated that I was more aligned with John sort of in the shadows holding back from the fray a person who tends to get a little too lost in themselves which that kind of hits the nail on the head and one stated that I was most aligned with Peter impulsive bold a little extreme and strong faith, soft heart, quick to repent. Not too sure about that. <laughs> I'll hold my reserve comment on that. It's, uh, uh, let me ask you for a moment, who do you identify with of the apostles the most? Does anyone have an apostle that they identify with more than the other? John. John. Mm -hmm. Anybody, do you have a reason why? Give us your secrets. Uh, he always referred to himself as the, as the apostle that Jesus loved. Right. And I don't think it was a, I don't think it was a, a selfish kind of thing. I think it was humbling. I think he was, he was like, wow. He's like, you know, it's like you, like you always think, like, oh, I must be mom's favorite. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way I think. Right. It. Thanks, Dan. Anyone else have one that they identify with? Oh, oh, it's here. Sorry. Mine's Peter. Peter. Because of um, when Jesus told him, you know, even you will um, deny me three times. Mm -hmm. And that just, that, that hits a chord with me because of my past. Okay. So. But he didn't quit there. He Right. You know, he repented and, and he was sorrowful and, and Jesus showed him the way back. And he so. kept moving sp forward in spite of. Right. Right. It's amazing how many people tend to identify with Peter, I think ex exactly for the reason that you stated. And Peter within the Gospels received a lot of airtime. Um, someone was always, whenever he tripped or fell or whenever uh, he stated something that was kind of off the mark a little bit, somebody was always there to record it. Um, within our society, it would be the pot, like the paparazzi following behind a celebrity. Um, and every time they did something that was odd or um, noteworthy, they would uh, videotape it and then put it on social media for the whole world to see. So it was the equivalent of, to, of that. I think that's what makes Peter so identifiable with all of us and one of the more popular apostles. We can all see ourselves within him, within his mistakes as well as his victories. He was the thick-skinned disciple and often spoke something that other people were thinking but kind of didn't have the nerve to talk about. He was a man who sinned and sinned boldly, and yet he was a good representation of humanity. 
So today we're going to take a look at Peter, as G and, or as Peter, as Jesus called him, the rock, not to be confused with the other rock, um, <laughs> who is the action hero, but this is Jesus' rock. We'll look at the way his strong-willed temperament was cherished and changed by the Lord. We'll also look at how his great mistakes, as well as his amazing insights, were evident throughout his ministry. Finally, we'll look at how his, uh, this uneducated lower middle class man became this focused, bold preacher who walked through hell and high water uh, to lead the church. So, let's start with Peter's calling or his early life. We know that he, was, uh, he lived on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. He grew up fishing, um, and this was something, a, a skill that he uh, probably learned from his father. He lived in a village uh, with people from a lot of diverse backgrounds and had, who had different worldviews of what were going on, of what was going on. One of the early chores of Simon was to separate the uh, non-kosher fish, like catfish, from the kosher fish um, and give the non-kosher fish to the, sell the non-kosher fish to the Gentiles and the kosher fish to the Jews. Uh, Peter probably spoke a couple of languages, in, including Greek, but he didn't um, read or write well. Um, by today's standards, he would be considered a blue-collar worker. Um, for some reason, I don't know, did any, does anyone watch the show King of Queens in here? It's a character on their name. Okay, we have one person, Mr. Miller. Um, it's a character on their name, Doug Heffernan, who's this kind of earthy blue-collar worker, a sort of everyman, and for whatever reason, that's who Peter reminds me of. Peter was within the Gospels, usually in a boat or in the water, um, and as someone who worked in the water, he was able to do a lot of uh, study of, of uh, the water and the wave patterns and different things from year to year in, able, uh, in order to be able to do his job effectively. He worked a lot from instinct and gut feelings, as people in those type of professions do, and he, he really trusted his instincts quite a bit. Notice what Luke tells us in today's Gospel reading, Luke 5, 1 through 3. One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water, at water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. So let's examine that scene a little bit. Jesus goes up to Peter in one of those boats and says, okay, I'm in the boat now, take me out. I want to talk to this crowd of people. Now, for me, I never looked at it as anything odd because I'm thinking, oh, it's Jesus, so, you know, of course he would do it, but that's not the way it was. It was this stranger who went to him and said, you know, I'm getting in your boat, take me out of there, take me out. Now, imagine you're in your car, sitting at a light, and all of a sudden, someone goes, opens the door and says, hops in and says, now, take me over there, I want to talk to some people. What would your reaction be to that? <laughs> uh, okay, that did actually happen to me one time. It was uh, pouring down rain, and I'm at the corner of a street, um, and a lady knocks on my door on the passenger side, and she was clearly having trouble breathing. I guess it was, maybe she had maybe something like an asthma attack or something like that. And she did ask me, could you take me around the corner? And I did, maybe not one of my brighter moves, but something in me said, okay, she seems safe enough. So I did do that. And I believe Dan said something like that happened to him as well. So it is a kind of odd feeling. So we can only imagine what Peter uh, felt when Jesus did that, but he did it for him. Now, not only did Peter, did Jesus ask him to uh, go ahead and take me out to shore, 
But Jesus also suggested how he could do his job more effectively. So the next scripture says, when he had finished speaking, Luke 5, 4 through 5, Luke 5, 4 through 5. He said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Masters, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I'll let down the nets. So Peter responded to him for some reason. I don't know if it was the message that he had given or what exactly Peter was responding to. Maybe he thought, if this person is bold enough to, you know, hop in my boat, um, maybe he knows what, he, what he's talking about and nothing else has worked, so why not? When Luke 5, 6 through 7, when they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. The catch was unbelievable. It was so unbelievable that Peter and his partners knew that it had to be something supernatural going on because they had been so unsuccessful before. And this was telling them that Jesus had to be someone special. Peter's reaction to this was um, Petery. So... <laughs> Luke 5, 8 through 11. When Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee and Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on you will fish for people. People. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. What a response. What a response from that one act. Peter said, I'm in. I'm in 100%. Um, how many times has Jesus got within a situation that we were in and we thought we were in charge, and we thought we knew what best, what was best. And Jesus got in our boat and told us the better, a better way to do it. What was our reaction? Did we have a Peter-like reaction, which is, okay, Jesus? Or was it more of a, uh, well, I'll see. What about today? How is Jesus interrupting something in your life today? What is the Lord throwing off balance in your life that you need to be paying attention to? Had not Peter been the impulsive, drama-hungry guy we all come to know and love, he might never have become the great disciple that God knew he could be. What's going on in your life today um, that's keeping you from being the disciple that, that God knows, knows that you can be? What are you holding back in your life from God? And this is just the very beginning of Peter being Peter. I want to share two examples uh, for, uh, for you, and we're not going to go there. This is from Matthew uh, 16, 13 to 16. Um, and we find Jesus is, and his disciples coming to Caesarea, Caesarea Philippi. I can't tell you how many times I practiced that. I'm so proud of myself. <laughs> Caesarea Philippi. I'll say it again. When he asked them, who do people, and we talked about this in Speaking of Life, who do people say the Son of Man is? And they gave him a bunch of different answers and, um, that were kind of off the mark. But then he got a little more specific and said, but what about you? Who do you say I am? And Peter was the one who responded, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. I can only imagine the, the excitement that Peter um, had in him, in him as he spoke those words. Um, we will go to Matthew 16, 17 to 19. Okay. Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you, I, t I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock 
I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. I don't know if I gave you that scripture or not, Bob. As mentioned in speaking of life, Caesarea Philippi, there I said it again, was the Las Vegas of its time. It was kind of a seedy location and um, kind of an ugly place that uh, nice people wouldn't go to. Um, but Jesus knew exactly what he was doing by taking the people, uh, taking his disciples there and um, bringing them there and bringing his message there. He knew exactly why he wanted to go there because he needed to be in the seediest of places, seediest of places that needed divine intervention. And it was in this place that was seedy and in need of a savior that Peter blurts out what probably was something that was based on his gut in instinct, which is, you're the guy, you're God's man within that environment. It's there within that environment that Jesus gives Peter this uh, unpredictable friend, the nickname of the rock, Rocky or the Rock or something that's stable. When in reality, from what we've seen, maybe he should have been someone nicknamed Short Circuit or Hothead or Firebrand. But God saw who he knew he was going to be and who he knew he could be, which is strong and stable and someone who was worthy to lead his church. In the next example, we see another example of Peter's lack of impulse control, but this one got him in a little bit of trouble. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to re rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? And that's Matthew 16, 21 through 26. So we have those two examples, um, both um, of Peter being boisterous and sort of uh, having outburst. One, Jesus refers to him as a rock after his outburst. And the other one, Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. So he goes from the highest of victories and kind of a compliment to kind of a fail right in a row. Now, we don't know if they happen right exactly in the row because the Gospels um, don't always tell us when time has, how much time has elapsed elapsed, but the contrast in the experiences are obvious. Ma Peter's main problem here is that Peter is trying to apply his old understanding to a new thing. The disciples saw Jesus as the fulfillment of dreams they grew up with. So if he, the Messiah, is dead, how can he reestablish re the nation of Israel? and restore the nation to the old glory. So their minds would not allow them to see how this could unfold if he was not there. So Peter had a, you know, a hard time with this. And how many times do we try and put God into a box in an old way of thinking? Um, and if it doesn't work out this way, Lord, then how can it work out? Um, I have my prayer partner here today who we talk about um, writing scripts. I'm notorious for writing scripts on how God should do things. 
and I'll write these long scripts, including conversations, and then this person will say this, and then I'll say this, and then this person will say this, and I'll say this, and it's finished. And I'll give my script to God and tell him how he should do it. And oddly enough, he does not listen to me a lot of the times. And I don't think it's even in itself bad to kind of think how something might unfold once you pray about something. But when you get upset when it doesn't unfold the way you think it should, that's when it's a problem. So Peter got upset because he just could not see the way uh, this could unfold if Jesus Christ was not uh, alive anymore. Um, so sometimes Peter's impulsiveness worked towards the glory of God, but sometimes it was an epic fail. An epic fail, but Peter wasn't paying attention, and he wasn't seeing that, jo that Jesus was doing something new in this situation. And we know that God does not work on our timeline. We know that God thinks differently than we do, praise God, and we know that his ways are way better than our ways and his thoughts are way better than our thoughts. Isaiah 58, 55, 8 through 9 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither my ways your ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. There was another time Peter's hot temper God, Peter seems like a mess sometimes, doesn't he? It was Peter's hot temper got in the way. What, does anyone know what that situation was where he got really upset? In the Garden of Gethsemane? Yes, when what happened? The soldiers came to arrest Jesus and took up the sword. And, and sliced off the dude's ear. <laughs> sliced, off the, sliced off the dude's ear, yes. Um, and what did Jesus do? said, no, Peter, those who live by the sword will die by the sword. Mm -hmm. And Peter uh, and Jesus and Christ healed, the, yeah. healed, healed him. His name was Malchus. Thank you so much. Um, and so after that happened, Peter did the same thing the other disciples did. And what was that? Hmm? He fled, ran to the hills. But... Peter, and again, I, I hadn't thought of it this way, Peter did something after that. He turned discreetly and followed Jesus to the courts. It's there that Peter faced one of the most embarrassing, noteworthy time, times in, in, in his life. And that was when he, who knows what that was, denied Christ three times. This is the Peter that we no, and we'd rather not identify with, but we do sometimes because there are ways in our lives, maybe not as dramatic, that we can deny Christ, but we can do it. Um, what was neat about this is although Peter fled with the rest of the disciples, he came back. If you recall, after Peter's third denial, Luke tells us the Lord turned and looked at, and looked at Peter. Peter was there, close enough to be seen by Jesus. This imperfect, unpredictable man who's known for his de denial was still strong enough to stay near God in the spotlight. So, many speculate Peter... Um, was martyred during the persecu persecution of the early church. Tradition had it uh, states that Peter requested that he not be martyred like Christ because he wasn't worthy of that. He, he asked that he be martyred, be uh, crucified upside down. Um, but before he was, and I didn't know this, this was something new for me, um, Historians have said that before that, the Romans crucified his right, wife right in front of him as he yelled to her, Remember Christ. Remember Christ. What can we learn from our brother, the rock? 
What can we take away from this story? What does this teach us about Jesus in our relationship to him? Number one, God has great dreams for you. Amazing dreams for you. He saw very quickly what kind of man Peter was, and he knew he could use him in some very, very, very powerful ways. Because Jesus, Peter wanted to follow Christ. Remember today that, that God has great dreams for you and me too. He didn't choose you because he had nothing else to do. You weren't some afterthought or uh, something he put together because he, didn't, because he had some extra time on his hands. He was very specific, very focused in his creation of you. He saw you in your sins and he sees what you'll become in your life, in this life and the next. Let him dream and share those dreams with you. And sometimes those dreams look absolutely nothing like what you had in store for yourself. Um, and I can tell you those dreams, even though they don't look like what you thought, they're 100% better uh, when you let those dreams, God's dreams and ideas for you unfold in your life. Second, God accepted Peter just the way he was and he accepts us just the way we are. We don't have to change to get God's attention, but once he has our attention, he starts to change us, often through the sometimes horrifying mistakes that we make. Peter learned from his mistakes and his embarrassments, and he grew from them. Jesus wants to make you new and transform you, but he also loves you just the way you are. Um, I used to pray and I thought I was being so spiritual when I said this prayer. Lord, stop me from being me with the tears flowing down my face. Lord, stop me from being me until someone much wiser than myself told me God doesn't want you to stop being you. He created you. He loves you. He wants you to put your hand in his hand and he'll transform you and make you into one of the person he needs to be you to be he'll take those traits and those characteristics that are in you that you see as a deficit and he'll turn them into something that he can use to his glory Paul I think about Paul who uh, zealously killed Christians. I mean, he put his whole heart, soul, mind, and body into killing Christians. But when he was converted and God started to use him, that same zealousness that he had in killing Christians was used to glorify God. And he put all of his energy in that. So those negative traits that we have that we think are horrifying, and I won't go through mine today because they'll scare you, I guarantee you. God will use those traits, and I'm looking forward to him using me in this, my 52nd year, for whichever way that he wants to use me. He'll take those traits that I find horrifying, and he'll use those to his glory. Peter didn't stop being Peter once God started to use him. Peter was still Peter the fisherman once he started to be used by God. Um, he still made mistakes, but when he made those mistakes, he got back up again. And for that, we're so thankful. And finally, the great lesson we'll learn from Peter is put yourself out there. Do something a little different. Somebody asks you to give a sermon, say okay. <laughs> Why not? You might make great mistakes, but at least you'll be doing something. Peter's great example is no matter what, he kept going. When he fell, he got back up again. Even in that denial, which from this side sounds, oh, he denied Jesus. He still, after he fled, got up and continued to follow God which is just amazing. He didn't wipe his hands clean and say, well, I really messed up, so let me, I'm done. He got up and he continued. And that's something we can learn from him. That's one of the great lessons. And through it all, through all the mistakes and blunders, 
we know that Jesus is faithful and we're going to make mistakes. We're going to make horrible mistakes. But we're going to get up and we're going to dust ourselves off and we're going to keep going. And that's the lesson we can learn from Peter. To remember Christ. Remember Christ. I have a quote from one of a contemporary theologian named Francis Chan. Our greatest fear should not be of failure, but of succeeding at things in life that don't really matter. Are we doing things today that matter? Are we presenting ourselves to a, as a living sacrifice to Jesus Christ? So we are going to end today. Miss Sarah will sing a song that we've sang before, but I want this to be sort of your declaration as you leave here today. And it's the song, Here I Am, Lord presenting ourselves as a sacrifice, offering ourselves over to God to do and be whoever he wants us to be. Amen? Lord God Almighty in heaven, we just thank you, Father in heaven, for today. We thank you, Father in heaven, for the examples of your apostles, specifically Peter today, one who would blunder, who would fall, who would trip, who would say strange things, but who would get back up again, Father in heaven. Give us the wherewithal. Give us the motivation, Father in heaven, when we do stumble, as we will, because we are humans and we are fallible. Give us the wherewithal to stand up, Father, and walk strong within our faith, Father in heaven. We love you, Father in heaven. We love what you're doing in each and every one of our lives, Father. And we want to be transformed, Father, and... Um, made into what you want us to be. We give you the praise, we give you the honor, we give you the glory today, Father. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.